Okay, it looks like we have a good crowd this morning. Uh, my name is Patrick Vanderheide, and I'm a community manager here at Tableau. And uh, this is a Think Data Thursday for January of 2019. Uh, our presenter today is Steve Wexler. Uh, Steve Wexler is uh, one of our Zen masters here at Tableau. He's uh, the founder of Data Revelations and the co-author of the Big Book of Dashboards, visualizing your data using real-world business scenarios. Uh, Steve has worked with ADP, Gallup, Deloitte, Convergis, Consumer Reports, The Economist, Con Ed, DNB, Marist, Cornell University, Stanford University, Trade, uh, Trade Web, Tiffany, uh, McKinsey and & Company, and many other organizations to help them understand and visualize their data. Steve is a five-time Tableau Zen Master, Iron Viz Champion, and Tableau Training Partner. Uh, his presentations and training classes combine an extraordinary level of product mastery with the real-world experience gained through developing thousands of visualizations for dozens of clients. Steve has taught thousands of people in both large and small organizations and is known for conducting these seminars with clarity, patience, and humor. Uh, and we are, we are really pleased to have Steve with us this morning. His presentation this morning will cover um, the topic of uh, data art, infographics, and business dashboards, uh, what you can show versus what you should show. Um, so this is a uh, a presentation I've been really looking forward to for, for our team and for our community. Um, are you, uh, to, to cover exactly what's going into this, is are you overwhelmed by the variety of data visualization examples you're seeing in magazines, Twitter feeds, or on Tableau Public? You're not, uh, you're not alone as we're experiencing a deluge of this porn, creative and often confusing ways to present data. If you're wondering, given all, given all of this, how should I present my data? Uh, you are, again, not alone. In this section, five-time Tableau Zen Master and Big Book of Dashboards author Steve Wexler will explore how people process information along with three overarching principles that will help you present your data so people can best understand it. Um, and before we jump in, Steve, I just uh, a couple of uh, housekeeping items, everyone. Uh, we are recording this presentation, and it will be available on our YouTube channel later this afternoon. Our YouTube channel is uh, Think and Talk Data uh, in the Tableau, uh, Tableau Software uh, YouTube channel, on, of course, on YouTube. And uh, as for questions, um, please leave your questions until the end of the presentation and use the Q&A feature. This helps us keep track of uh, what questions have been asked uh, and answered. So that's, uh, that's very helpful for us as well. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Steve. Okay, Patrick and Tableau, thank you so much for the opportunity as I wave hello to you from Muppet Labs here in uh, bucolic Briarcliff Manor, New York, about 45 minutes out of New York City. I will stop my video so you can pay rapt attention to the presentation and uh, let me share my screen. So this is actually something that we cover in workshops around the big book of dashboards, art versus infographic versus business dashboard, the deluge of amazing visualizations we're seeing. And should I be making something that looks like that or should I be making something quite a bit different? What am I supposed to do? Very briefly, Patrick did the introduction. I'm the founder and sole employee of Data Revelations. I was Tableau's inaugural Iron Viz champion. I was back with uh, Tableau for the IBM 360 mainframe and doing visualization on punch cards were extremely difficult. I'm a five-time Tableau Zen master. And as I point out in the community, we know that's an actual thing and you need to be anointed. Outside of the Tableau community, you hand somebody a business card that says Zen master on it and they think, God, this guy must be a complete tool. Who calls himself a Zen master? Um, I'm very proud of those two accomplishments, the being the tool and the Iron Viz champion, but by far uh, the thing I'm most proud of is being one of the three authors of uh, the big book of dashboards, along with fellow tool and Zen master Jeffrey Schaefer and uh, technical evangelist for Tableau, Andy Cotgrave. All right, before we get into the, uh, the heart of the matter, I'm going to present three slides that are, these are the three major overarching principles, the things that you should always be thinking about in creating data visualization. It's amazing it's taken me 12, 13 years to get to this point. But uh, who is your audience? What's the message? And then this simple sentence that's taken years to kind of hone, and that is, for the largest number of people, provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort. If you're making business dashboards and have this in mind, 
that's probably going to steer you well. Infographics and data are a different need, but we'll get back to that in a moment. Also, you want to be good at this stuff, and, and so many of you already are, or you're getting better at it. You need to understand humans do some things really well when it comes to visual perception and other things ridiculously poorly when it comes to visual perception. So um, I could spend easily an hour on this, but just want to focus on our visual perception abilities are amazing. A cognitive system, it's also highly flawed. I want to give you a quick example of uh, an exam where it kind of points out some of the flaws, and I'll do this in a, a workshop. And uh, obviously, I can't see if you're holding up your hands, but I'm going to show you a picture in a, of a bathroom. And I want you to mentally imagine raising your hand when you see the toothbrush in the bathroom, okay? And you know, at this point, lots of hands go up, and most people are finding the toothbrush right there. And remarkably few see the toothbrush, which is over here, which is, even though that's the largest object in the bathroom. By the way, I missed it the first time I saw this as well. So just realize, oh, wait a second, how do, what's wrong with my cognitive system that I'm missing the biggest thing that's in there? Uh, another case in point, just how we perceive things. And this kind of underscores why it is that we see so many bar charts. Humans are really good at judging the length of bars and comparing from a common baseline how much bigger or smaller a bar is than the other bar. Uh, in this case, I'm showing you three different ways to plot the same data. A is the number 37, and B is the number 75, 37 and 75. And most people, and we've done massive polls on this, will tell you that, oh, I can see with a bar chart over here, yeah, B is about twice as big as A. Some people with really well-defined OCD will go, oh, it looks to be just a little bit bigger than twice as big. We're really good at that, judging the length of things or the position of things from a common baseline. All right, the circles that are in the middle, very few people get that right. Most people think that B is one and a half times as big as A. It's twice as big. And the, the use of color down over here, I don't know anyone on the planet that will say, oh, circle B is twice as blue as that other circle. Now, we're wickedly good at seeing the subtlest differences in shades, we just can't quantify that. Now, getting back to the one in the center over here, right, the, um, uh, I wanna try to bring this home a little bit more for you. I'm gonna put one circle inside the other circle. And now, you th if, you're, if you're on this webinar, if you're watching YouTube, you're into data visualization, you think about this and you're kind of, you know, you're either trained or getting there. But most people who don't think about it, and you were to ask them, hey, the smaller circle, what percentage of the bigger circle do you think it's taking up? They'll say a pretty large number. The smaller circle is taking up half. It's 50% of the larger one. So just realize there are things that humans do well naturally, or they've been trained to since birth, and there are things we just don't do well at all, and one is judging the size of circles. So, as you think about data visualization, I want to quote Andy Kirk, who wrote an excellent book called Data Visualization. What is data visualization? Although he would have put an S instead of a Z up there because he's British. The representation and presentation of data that exploits our visual perception abilities in order to amplify cognition. Another way of interpreting this, take advantage of stuff that people do well and try to avoid the stuff that they do badly. Okay, with that in mind, I feel I have to fess up on something. You know, I'm supposed to be reasonably good at this stuff. Got a book, Zen Master, Iron Viz type of stuff, and I am blown away and in fact sometimes intimidated by some of the stuff that I'm seeing coming out of the Tableau community. And I can imagine someone who hasn't been doing it for as long as I am, how they feel about stuff. You know, this is something from Johnny Walker, and I think he created this before he um, joined Tableau and, and, and helping make Tableau public the amazing uh, platform that it is. But I look at this and go, is, is this guy using the same tool that I'm using? Holy crap. Um, who makes stuff like this? This is unbelievable. 
And then here's Mike Cisneros. Um, Mike is a fellow Tableau Zen master, and he's showing this Tableau Follow Friday, and it's all the different uh, people that are contributing the community. And, and, and each Friday kind of highlights someone that says, hey, this person's doing really cool work. Holy crap, look at this these beautiful, engaging, intoxicating images that are going on here. Here's one that was recently published, part of a data visualization competition for Ludovic uh, Tavernier. Um, he was, an, uh, I think, the European Iron Viz champion, and he competed in the 2018 um, uh, Iron Viz and, uh, in New Orleans. And this is just gobsmackingly beautiful work. And here, this is not a Tableau visualization. This comes from Georgia Lupi, who is a data visualization and graphic designer genius, work is in the Smithsonian, very involved with the, the humanization of data visualization. And uh, this is one of Jeff Schaefer's favorite dashboards. He and I have had big arguments about whether we should be showing this in our workshops or not. I will come back to this in a little bit. And, and, and I see something like this and going, is this the type of stuff that I should be making? It's, it's, it's dazzling. Uh, let me bring things down to earth a little bit and discuss one of my favorite uh, social visualization initiatives that is out there, uh, Makeover Monday. I hope you have heard about it. If not, I encourage you to, uh, to look into it. Uh, this was something founded originally one run by Andy Kreeble and Andy Cotgreave. It is now maintained. Uh, rather heroically by Andy Kreeble and um, Eva Murray, where each week they find a data set, they show the original graphic that supported the data set, and then they ask people to come up with different ways to visualize that data. Now, I think this is a great initiative. Sometimes it can have some uh, unexpected consequences, which is some of the stuff that people produce, and I can imagine newbies in the field looking at it and going, should I be making a viz like that? Uh, let me show you some examples uh, of this. So here was um, the a catalyst for a uh, Makeover Monday. Um, uh, this comes from a poll run by Piper uh, Jaffray, and it was, um, they asked specifically, of all the tools that you use for social media, social networks, which is your favorite? And they showed that, you know, the interesting story here is Snapchat went from uh, two and a half years before the poll was taken from um, worst to first. And the question is, is there another way to visualize this data that may get the thing across more with a greater degree of impact? And ready, set, go. And I'm going to show you some things that were produced by the community. Uh, here is a waffle chart um, that came from uh, Mavuj Khan. And I don't think I would have done this, but, but you know, decided to experiment with, uh, hey, um, I just want to create a, um, see what it would be like to create a waffle chart. Uh, let me show you something from um, uh, Corey Jones. Corey does resplendent work. And uh, he was an Iron Viz uh, competitor last year. And he's borrowing a technique that he learned, which first advocated or promoted by Roddy Zakovich. Uh, Roddy calls this thing a uh, area bump chart. Um, uh, I think there's an official term for it. It's called a ribbon chart. But it's an attempt to show that, you know, went from worst to first and also try to show, well, how much bigger or smaller are these things? Um, and I can't help whenever I see a ribbon chart or an area bump chart, it, it just reminds me of this. Um, here's, I think, a far simpler visualization. Uh, this one comes from Colin. I'm going to say, Colin, I'm going to, uh, Wojowitz. I'm sorry for mangling your last name. I think this is a great job. Um, it's really highlighting very simply, starting in the first period that I went from uh, Snapchat went from 11% to 47%. I want you to remember that area bump chart slash ribbon chart from Roddy Zakovich because he participated in this Makeover Monday as well. And I am blown away by this. This is so simple, so clear. He did a slope graph. Everything is muted except the thing that he wants to highlight, Snapchat going from worst to first. I can easily make the comparison of how much bigger Snapchat is than Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. And I became, I was always a fan of Roddy's, but I be, think I became a bigger fan because Roddy can out-curvy anybody. 
in terms of making cool, curvy stuff. But he didn't in this case. Why? Because the message, making the point he was trying to make, was more succinct and easier to understand making this type of chart. By the way, I'd like to think had I had the same data set, I would have come up with the solution. All right, let me show you uh, another example. Um, and I think um, Andy and Eva found a great data set and a just horrible visualization to make over. This is a visualization showing, uh, I think in 2017, um, the 25 most profitable companies in the world. And it's how much money each company makes in profit every second of the day. And um, in 2017, Apple made $1,444.76 um, uh, every second. So at this point, they've made 15,000. No, make that 17,000. No, make that $19,000 in profit. Is this really the best way to visualize this? So let's look at some of the things that people came up with and, and, and um, uh, how they presented it and, and, and uh, what it looked like. Absolutely love this data visualization. This comes from Zach Geis, and he's creating a bar chart. He's highlighting Apple using effective use of color. And I can see that Apple is almost twice as big as JP Morgan. And I can easily see which is second from the top, what's third from the bottom, how much bigger is something else. Here is something from one of my um, favorite visualization uh, gurus. This comes from Curtis Harris, kick-ass job making this something which is mobile friendly. And he's using a bar chart. Look at the labeling that he has. Look at that he's putting the name of the company inside the bar so everything is fitting very effectively. But He's using a bar chart. Why? Because it's easy for people to make comparisons. Here is something that comes from Philip Riggs. He does great work. He also does data noodles, which are these cartoons. Um, he has a superpower that I don't. He can create really clever little cartoons that can draw people in, in case you need to draw people in. In business context, I don't think you need to. Business dashboards, but we'll discuss that in a moment. And he decided he wanted to focus on the top pharmaceutical firm. And you know what? I can see and how much money they're making overall. And I could see roughly that Apple is making three times as much as Gilead. I don't have to work hard to see that. Now, I want to show you another example. And this one comes from Mark uh, Bradbourne. And, and it, God, I'm, I'm going to make a little change to this thing. I am not picking on Mark. Mark is one of, does incredible work, and he's one of the pillars of the community. And in this case, he decided, hey, I want to stretch out a little bit. I want to try a, a different type of visualization here and see how it would work and, and, and learn some new techniques that might be useful at, at some other time. And I remember the first time that I saw this thing, and take a look at the title, what the most profitable companies make per second. I thought, you know, I could change this title and people would totally buy that I'm really talking about this, North Korean ballistic missile tests. So I'm, I'm, I'm not faulting Mark for trying the technique in, in by any ways. I don't think I would have used that in a business context because it's hard for me to compare these things and what's this arc versus that arc, et cetera. My concern was someone coming into this, looking at all these different visualizations and seeing people's reaction to some of the things with curvy and, and fluorescent colors type of stuff. Rightfully, this got a lot of people going, hey, this is really cool. But I'm wondering if someone new to this would look at this and think, oh, I should be making something like that because you know it got retweeted a lot or a lot of people favored it. Right around the same time um, uh, that I was seeing you know, some of these interesting and, and exotic visual experimentations. And I, I really, you know, Mark, if you're listening to this, you kick ass and you are great for the community. I, I just don't think I would have visualized it this way. And, and I have no problem with the experimenting with it. But around the same time, this article was in the New York Times Magazine, what teenagers are learning from online porn. And I'm not suggesting that some that stuff is viz porn, but that the concern was that that teenagers have such ready access to online porn they're looking at things and saying, is this how I'm supposed to behave? Is this how um, 
I, I should look? Is this how I should dress and act, et cetera? And I wonder if people in the data visualization community feel the same way. Now, it doesn't help that until recently, this was Tableau's home screen. And I'm sorry, man, that gets a screaming cat as a data visualization. Screaming cat is something from the big book of dashboards and an icon when we say, do not make a viz that looks like this. I mean, that looks cool, but I defy you to, to learn anything useful uh, from, this, from this data visualization. So, you know, with all this in mind, you know, you're seeing stuff that looks like this, 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 all these different things coming your way. What am I supposed to do? How should I be visualizing this stuff? Nope, I'm, I'm going to give you some recommendations in a minute, but I want to go back to that Georgia Loopy dashboard that we looked at it um, uh, a little while ago. So early on when Jeff and I were doing workshops uh, together, um, we still do them once in a while together. Jeff is way busier than I am with a million different things. Um, and Jeff really wanted to include this dashboard, and I could see why he loved it. Um, and uh, let's explore it a little bit. So here's a legend at the top that explains how to understand what's going on. That, that thick line that's over here. Um, that's the average age within a category. The dotted line is the average age of Nobel laureates overall. So I can see, oh, this person is, uh, these two people are older than average. Two people got a Nobel laureate. And um, hey, in this category, um, you know, it's chemistry, physics, do you need to be a PhD, uh, have a master's degree, bachelor's degree, uh, et cetera. And then you know, here are the different categories, chemistry, economics, physics, et cetera. Um, you'll notice that some of the marks have a little magenta halo around them, and very few of the marks do. That, those are the Nobel laureates that uh, were or are women. And you know, that immediately begs a question in my view, which is, um, how many women are Nobel laureates? And, and uh, are there more Nobel Prize winner, women Nobel Prize winners now than there were um, 100 years ago? Just keep that in mind for a second. Here it's showing in each category that I think that the, the top category is chemistry, the second category is economics, then physics, and then we have literature over here, and it's interesting, you know, uh, turns out you can get a degree in literature, uh, you can get a Nobel Prize uh, and you probably don't have to have a PhD to do that. And where do these people all end up teaching? And then where do they all, uh, where are their hometowns? And then some really fascinating, uh, interesting, um, uh, uh, cool things about the data. This one in particular really caught my eye, that there were two brothers that won Nobel Prizes, one in economics and one in medicine. Can you imagine their grandmother's bragging rights? Oh, that's very nice. Your sonny is a doctor. Both my grandchildren won Nobel Prizes, although their grandmother was probably died at that point. These things tend to happen later in life. In any case, this is an amazing piece of work, but I'm wondering, would, would I ever do this in a business context? So let's focus on that question about um, women versus men, Nobel laureates. And I decided I want to explore that. And I feel... I am taking this amazing piece of work by Georgia Lupi, this, you know, um, I, I will say we will represent it as Elvis Presley, and I am, I am removing its soul and I'm kind of turning it into um, Lawrence Welk. But think about the question that I wanted to know. And, and by the way, I purposely fashioned something which is kind of a little bit hard and, and chiseled, but the percentage of men versus women. And if that's what you're looking for, I just think this does a better job of answering the question. Oh, I can see 5% of the Nobel laureates overall are women. And I can see how it's distributed and there are very few in physics. And I think maybe there's one in economics. And I can in fact see what's happening over time that there is, does seem to be um, a, a bit of improvement with this. So if, I, if that's the question I wanted to answer, I would argue that while not as poetic, and, um, and enthralling, this does a pretty good job of answering it. And obviously you can click on different things and it would highlight, et cetera. Um, 
I'm going to guess that a lot of people here have seen this graph because anytime there's a data visualization book or class or whatever, people cite this. And I think largely because of Edward Tufte's 1983 seminal work, The Visual Display of Quantitative Data. Tufte argues that this is the best statistical graph ever made. And if you have not seen this before, this was made by Charles Menard in, I think, the 1870s. Um, and it is a, uh, oh, actually, I think it was done in 1869. And it is an attempt to show on a map Napoleon's attempt to conquer Russia in 1812 through 1813. Briefly, if you haven't seen it before, the thickness of the light colored brown band is the number of troops that um, Napoleon had when he started his uh, attempt to move east to Moscow. And there were 420,000 troops here. Gets to Moscow, it was a disaster. And this is, the black line is the retreat. By the way, there are some people that are joining the fray because they're being attacked from the rear. So here is the return trip and ends up with just 10,000 troops at the end. Started with 420,000, ended with 10. This down here is the temperature outside on something called the Rameau scale, which we now use Fahrenheit or Celsius, and uh, the, the temperature in the return trip. It was unbearably cold. And Tufte argues, this is the best statistical graph ever made. Okay, well, here's what Seth Godin, who's a marketing guru, uh, and said in a presentation, best-selling author on Menard's graph. This is one of the worst graphs ever made. Tufty's very happy because it shows five different pieces of information on three axes, and if you study it for 15 minutes, it really is worth a thousand words. I don't think that's what graphs are for. I think they try to make a point in two seconds for people who are too lazy to read the 40 words underneath. So I, I want to show you, you know, we're looking at Makeover Monday. I want to show you a, um, uh, a, a, a makeover that comes from Jorge uh, Camoas, um, uh, uh, Portuguese data visualization uh, expert, does incredible work in Excel and is starting to do some incredible work in Tableau. So here is uh, his recasting of the same data. Pie chart, died, survived. And, and, you know, maybe this is what the executive really needs to see and not that thing that takes 15 minutes to explore. Um, I'm not the only person that is thinking about um, data art versus infographics versus uh, dashboards. There was a great blog post from um, fellow Tableau uh, Zen master and, and really one of my favorite contributors to the field. This is from Adam McCann. And he took the same data set and he decided to render it as a, a data art, as an infographic, and as a business dashboard. So here's the same data set as art. I don't know what this is supposed to be about, but it really looks cool. It's 25 years of tropical storms. And I guess, you know, um, the orange ones are scarier than the blue ones. I'm not sure. Here's another attempt to show the data and, and where certain storms went. And, and then here's a business dashboard version of this. And he's in his blog post, he's written something and I've highlighted a couple of things in blue that I'm gonna read. Uh, but in my opinion, dashboards, gener dashboards generally have a specific or a very least a known audience. I agree with that. Infographics are meant to engage a broader, perhaps ill-defined audience in order to tell a story. I think often to grab people into a magazine. Data art, however, can have no defined audience, can be art for art's sake, therefore it can further emphasize aesthetic over understanding or accuracy. Um, I wanna kind of share my way of looking at, at design pressures. I do not consider myself a particularly adept graphic designer. I don't suck, but I'm not a, a graphic designer. And I think about, well, how, really beautifully chiseled and, and nicely fashioned as this thing have to be. And, and let me show you kind of the world I live in. I make dashboards for myself. No design pressure. Yes, I'd rather be driving in a Tesla than a Trabant, so I'd like something that looks nice, but it's for me. If I'm designing for a work group, 
I need to think of affordances, signifiers, considerations, what's going to help them, want it to look good. Departmental, more people are going to be using this. The executive, senior executive in the organization, ooh, this thing has to have a certain spit and polish. And by far, the hardest stuff I have to work on is if I'm working with a client and they are building something that is customer facing. This thing has to look great. I'm not talking about curvy lines. I just mean that the fit, precision, the cleanness of the lines, it's a reflection of the company's brand. I don't work here. Uh, general public, you know, think of some amazing graphic that you see in Wired Magazine. Think of that Georgia Lupe um, uh, visualization, which was in fact in a, in a full, uh, 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 full page spread in an Italian magazine. You know, you have this feeling that this has to be absolutely amazing. Again, I, I don't live here, but thinking about this again, you know, what are the pressures on someone who's doing um, an infographic that's going to appear in a magazine? Or, hey, um, look at all these things that are appearing in my Twitter feed or my LinkedIn feed, or I'm seeing all this stuff on Tableau Public. The, there's kind of this need to, I feel I need to attract people. And then hopefully inform, enlighten, and if they're informed, enlightened, they're going to be engaged with the, with the work. I don't think you need to do that in a business context. I'm not saying you don't need to do it in a, you may have to attract people. You don't want them turning from page 13 to page 14. What are you going to do to do that? In a business context, I don't buy that you need to do that. I think you need to inform, enlighten, and engage. Yeah, but by all means, make your stuff visual, your stuff attractive. Now, do you realize that all said, I think you can make really beautiful things without sacrificing the analytic integrity of stuff. I'm going to give you an example of this. So visualizations can be beautiful without sacrificing the analytic integrity. And I want to point you to a really good blog post from Stephen Few, who I got to say I disagree with more these days than I agree with. Um, he wrote, um, um, show me the numbers and um, uh, now I see it and it kind of to agree, become a bit of a curmudgeon and, and, and is uh, semi-retired at this point, but I really did like this blog post where he took issue with Time Magazine's lengthy scrolling infographic explaining why we still need Women's Equality Day in 95 years. So this is three, four years ago, 95 years after women got the right to vote, the U.S. government is still only about 20% female. And this thing scrolls, you know, to my feet at this point. And he's wondering why the, the isotypes, the pictograms, oh, here's a, par, uh, a pie chart. No, here's a waffle chart. Oh, look, I have little things with chairs over here. Why all the different things making it hard to make a comparison? So he offered up this data visualization. This is my take on this, where I sorted this starting with the percentage of voters. Hey, more than half the voters in the United States are women. Boom, here's the 50% line. And here's the representation in the Supreme Court, state legislatures, Senate, et cetera. Super easy to make a comparison. Now, uh, one of my heroes in the data visualization field is this guy, Alberto Cairo. He wrote The Functional Art and The Truthful Art. He's also a really good, he teaches data journalism at the University of Miami, um, a professor of data journalism, and he's also a really good graphic designer. So here was his, it, I think he did this in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and, uh, ooh, look, he's doing the 100% stack bar chart. He's doing the same thing with the 50% line. You know, we kind of realize this is a great way to, have analytic integrity, but the guy's got design chops. And he'll be the first to say, yeah, he knows the guy on the right. You know, he's supposed to be holding a clipboard. It looks like either a gun or a boomerang, but you get the point. So here's this lengthy sprawling thing on the left. And here's this very compact, easy to make the comparisons, but it will still draw you in, which fortunately I don't need to do. I'm living in a business context. Um, I would have no fault if you did this in a business context because you're using what I think is a really strong graph to tell the story that's here. Um, all right, one other thing to consider before we go any further. As you're thinking about um, you know, all these different things I'm kind of um, hitting you with. 
but that is, why am I doing this? And I'm going to change it to you. So why are you doing this? Why are you participating in Makeover Monday? Why are you practicing this? Why are you publishing something on Tableau Public? Why are you um, tweeting something? Why are you doing any of these things? Well, one is great reason to try out new techniques. Okay? You know, I've seen Mark Bradburn's work. You know, my guess is in the business context, he's not making that arc stuff. And I think it's great. You know, there are times when that stuff can be very effective, a jump plot, which is something that Christy Martini pioneered, to impress people with how amazing you are. That's absolutely fine. You know, you want, you know, you're trying to get a job. You're trying to get hired for work. I am so friggin' guilty of this thing. Um, and certainly earlier in my career, um, you know, I'd throw a Pareto chart in something, not necessarily because it was important to have a Pareto, but I wanted to uh, show people that I could build a relatively sophisticated visualization, or at least at the time it was considered sophisticated. Um, why are you doing this? To help people see and understand their data. Um, where have I heard that phrase before? That That is Tableau's mission statement, and and I just can't do any better than that in terms of what I think I'm supposed to be doing as well. And to make a real difference by showing people things they didn't know. Um, I've had three occasions in my career where I have seen companies change because of the data visualization. Um, and as cool as it could be to make uh, sand key diagrams or core diagrams or these, you know, what we'll call curvy stuff type of things, it is in fact possible for mere mortals, for, for anyone to using simple charts to change an organization, to really have an impact on how they uh, react to the data. And it doesn't require a sand key diagram. Uh, please, I'm not saying don't make a sand key if it's warranted. Just don't feel that that's what's going to be the thing. That's the only way that you're going to get someone to, to, to realize what's happening. Let me give you an example of this. This is maybe from six years ago. I would render this differently now. Um, but this, this is the actual chart. Let me explain what this is. Each dot represents 795 different companies or organizations. The higher the dot is, the greater the incidence of diabetes is. So there's an organization here that has like, you know, 27% of the employees and their families have diabetes versus down here, far fewer. And the organization, this was a major medical organization that was involved um, in having, trying to change employees' behavior, trying to get people more compliant. And the first step was to realize your organization has a problem. And when they just showed, hey, the incidence of diabetes in your organization is 18.5%, and that's way worse than everybody else. This puts you in the, you know, the bottom 1.1 percentile. And people kind of went, oh, that's really bad. When the organization saw this big black dot here and went, here's you and here's everybody else. And most people are way down here and you are a most unenviable outlier. It had a profound impact. I always had a profound impact on the sales reps selling this thing. They just went, holy crap, this is just, you know, we're really getting traction. People are looking at it. They want to know, how am I doing? So this is called a, a jitter plot. There's no real difference between a dot that's to the left versus a dot to, that's to the right. Just want to make it so that you can see the dots. There are nicer ways to make this, but I just want to point out that this is not a difficult data visualization. And it changed the way organizations um, looked at things. And, and, and I can say the, you know, the three times where, where I've seen major changes in an organization, it didn't require um, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, Charles Menard like of chart. It was a simple chart that was able to convey important data in a way that had real impact. So, Going back to the first thing I started with, you know, I, I said three things to keep in mind. 
I've now changed to four things to keep in mind. And these are four things I try very hard to remember. One is, who is your audience? What's the message? And for the largest number of people, provide the greatest degree of understanding with the least amount of effort. And as you're making this stuff, how is what you're building going to help? You know, are, are you helping your audience? Is it what they need to see or are you showing off? And in a business context, I don't think you need to be showing off um, on, on, you know, your portfolio on Tableau Public or whatever, absolutely. And um, if you want to learn more, I do hope you'll consider, if you don't have a copy, purchasing the Big Book of Dashboards. A lot of the dashboards are in Tableau format and downloadable from bigbookofdashboards.com. We also have other resources there. You can uh, see the chart chat that Jeff and I are engaged in every month, uh, as well as workshops that we'll be presenting. Also, my website is datarevelations.com. My subspecialty is visualizing survey data which makes me a huge hit at cocktail parties. Um, but there's a lot of uh, freely available content there. And if you are interested and um, want to strike up a discussion, send me an email at that email. And you can follow me on Twitter at, at VizBizWiz. Uh, I'm probably going to change that. I think you know years ago we all had these cute little monikers and I'm still viz, viz, whiz for now. And with that in mind, I'm going to stop the sharing and um, pass things back over to Patrick. Hey, and uh, Patrick, you can, um, you know, by the way, this is the first time I've delivered that in under 50 minutes. So uh, um, I've gotten, the, so we have a nice chunk of time for, uh, for Q&A. Hey, hello everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature. Um, and, and Steve, I thought maybe I'd start things off and just ask you a little bit about colors. Um, I know that you have uh, you've even explored and given me uh, some, some uh, critical assessments of some of my dashboards and some of the, the colors and ways that I've, that I've put things together. And so I was, just, I was just kind of curious about your, your thoughts on colors and, and, uh, and what works and what doesn't work there. You know what? Okay. Great question. Let me see if I can dig up something really quickly on this because it's, it's, it's also something that we do in the um, uh, uh, big book of dashboards. If I can't find it quickly, I don't want to hold people up, but Jeff and I, we agree on most things. We'll have some disagreements and by far um, our most, uh, the thing that we have the, the strongest and most firm agreement is on uh, the misuse of color specifically categorical color. Hey, I've got 14 different categories. I'm going to use 14 different colors. And people just cannot process that properly. If you look at the 28 different scenarios that are in the big book of dashboards, practically all the dashboards just use two or three colors. Maybe one of them has four or five. But um, hold on, let me see if I can find this quickly. And because it's worth it. So it's, and it's something I'm pretty passionate about, and I think people will enjoy the exercise. Okay, so um, my apologies for that. But again, it's a great question, and I think it's worth the effort. Okay, so... This is something that we do with a large group of people. We ask half the group to close their eyes and we show them this. And it rentals by day of week. And we then ask them, take that in, show them that for maybe about six seconds. We ask them to close their eyes. Then we show this to a different group of people. Show that for five seconds. And then we ask the first group, what conclusions did you reach? And someone raises his or her hand and say, oh, there are fewer bike rentals on the weekend. And we ask the second group, what conclusions did they reach? And they go, I don't know. They didn't see it. And the, the purposeful use of color is, is one of the, the, the biggest um, 
mistakes or the lack of the purposeful use of color is one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make. So thanks for asking that. It's one of the cooler things I like to discuss. And let's see, am I still sharing? Yeah, and so we have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the, the first one was, uh, when talking about types of presentations, there's often a distinction made between inform, inform, uh, informative, informative excuse me, and persuasive presentations. How do you see the pressures being, uh, between being informative and being emotive played out? Well, you know, the, the, what a, hey, cool question. And, you know, part of it is what's the purpose of the dashboard or what's the purpose of the presentation? Um, a dashboard is often a conduit to getting to um, a presentation. You're using the dashboard to explore, find key findings, um, uh, and, and, and draw conclusions. And, and maybe you just let the dashboard out there and let people find them. Maybe you use story points uh, to create this guided thing, or maybe you will create this very curated PowerPoint presentation where you want to make your point. Um, I'm sure a lot of people here have heard of the book Storytelling with Data by Cole Nussbaumer Nathlick. It is excellent. And, um, and it is about not just throwing the dashboard up there and saying, hey, explore all this stuff, but in finding really key and important things and making sure that the people who have a, a, the, uh, an interest in this can see the things that you have found. Um, whether, where, and how you do the emotional component, um, that's another story. Again, I'm thinking of a business context versus sales context versus, gee, I'm doing an op-ed piece for uh, some magazine where I'm trying to sway hearts and minds. These are very different audiences and very different purposes. Um, I can say that that the visceral impact of that jitterpot, which is here's your dot uh, and here are all these other dots, that has a real personal and emotional component to it. People really now see, they, they get it um, in a way that they don't have before. So uh, I am all for using your dashboard to then curate the result and present a key finding because you're going to be spending a lot more time with the data than the stakeholder. Thank you. Um, we have another question here. It's from Bin Lee. Uh, hello, Steve. I'm a college student and just starting to explore Tableau for three weeks. What's your advice for what to do and where to start to become efficient with Tableau? The, 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 um, the good news is the number of resources that are available for this are just outstanding. Tableau's own website and the on-demand training videos are fantastic. Um, uh, I strongly recommend um, going to data, um, uh, Jeffrey Schaefer's website, Data Plus Science. Um, he has curated links to a zillion different things as well as uh, I know he has a link for, hey, here are ways to get up to speed with this uh, very quickly. Um, certainly the Makeover Monday initiative, just don't, just don't feel intimidated because you're going to see some people who are just making these things that, you know, look like they were crafted by M Michelangelo and, and thinking, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to make anything like that. It's, that's, that's not the purpose of it. Um, but I would absolutely start um, other places to consider, you know, the, in addition to the training videos, uh, um, a lot of the Zen masters offer Tableau training. I, I know that's one of the things that Ryan Sleeper does. So a lot of good sources to getting up to speed. I think I'll add in there that uh, if, if you come to the forums and start taking part in answering other users' questions or trying to at least examine the questions that are being asked and, and delving into how you might answer them, uh, that too is a really great resource and, and a way to kind of put yourself in someone else's shoes as you learn Tableau. So that's a, a great thing there too. Ooh, um, I got to answer Aaron's question here. Sure. Um, yep. You mentioned how much harder it is to compare the size of circles versus the size of bars. Does that still hold for a scatter plot? Do you not recommend using the dots on your scatter plot to help provide perspective? Oh, the, the, the so think of a map with a bunch of different size dots on it. That's that's still very valid. I'll, I'll I'll you know I didn't I make sure in the workshop to show people that it's 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 that you're not going to be able to make an exact comparison. 
So the scatter plot with different size dots, that's very helpful. Oh, look, that's big. Oh, that's small. That's still a useful thing. You just may need another chart besides the scatter plot. So if someone wants to dig in and go, wow, just how big are those dots and how much bigger are they than those other dots, then you give them the bar chart. This is a huge reason why I believe in dashboards because one chart often doesn't tell the full story. So my apologies if I you know, somehow might have dissuaded you from using the size of circles. Just realize that pack bubbles by themselves versus bar charts, you got to give me a good reason. Scatter plot with different size circles? Yeah, I think you've given me a good reason. Wow, great question from Joshua here. Uh, Joshua is a um, fellow Tableau Zen master. Um, the work is one of my favorite contributors to the community. I will forever be indebted to Joshua for explaining how dates work to me and the rest of the community in Tableau. Um, and uh, the, so do check that out as, as well as all the other work he's doing and the incredible work with Tableau Prep. And Josh asks, what are the best ways to help newcomers in the community to understand the difference between some of the things they see and what they should expect to do? Josh, that's why I did this presentation. You know, that, and, and that's why I do the workshops, we write the book, why we tweet, why we blog, uh, et, et, et cetera. And, and, and it's difficult. And, and it took me a very long time. You know, I, you know, that's another thing that I would wish I could stress is that I was not, um, uh, I was not very good at this stuff on the get go. Um, I definitely posted to the Tableau 10 year challenge and showed some of my early work and it was pretty bad. And it was through the reading other people's blog posts, other people's books, uh, reading their arguments about things, following the discussions that it's possible to get better. Um, so I highly recommend uh, the Functional Art is a great book to have. I highly recommend uh, Cole Nussbaum and Affleck's um, Storytelling with Data. There are a bunch of other books that we recommend in the big book of dashboards. And we try to cover this and say, here are things that people do well and here are things that they do poorly. We also recognize you're living in the real world. And what happens when your boss says, I really like these packed bubbles. I really like this swirly stuff. Is there a way that you can find something that looks pretty cool, but doesn't compromise uh, analytic integrity? And, and we offer some ways to do that. So thanks, okay. Josh. That's the, the last question we have. Um, I want to thank you, Steve, for the presentation today. This has been wonderful, a uh, great presentation. Uh, we have uh, more dashboard presentations coming along uh, and kind of a little more hands-on in February when Bridget Cogley, uh, another Zen master and coworker of Joshua's, will be presenting on her work uh, with dashboards. So uh, it's great. I think this is going to be an, an, a wonderful uh, kind of lead in to that next, uh, to that next presentation uh, as we switch over to that. So I, I thank you so much. And um, again, this presentation is being recorded and will be on YouTube. So you can watch it and share it with other uh, with other people in the community um, I, uh, I hope you enjoyed today and uh, and if you have any comments or feedback for us uh, please don't hesitate to email us at uh, community at tableau.com okay uh, we'll call it good Patrick uh, Sierra and um, uh, other Patrick. and and other Patrick yes I'm confused I'm going wait a second there are two Patrick's thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you everybody else who joined today yeah thank you thank you Steve Okay. Goodbye.